This is a home studio rerun of a seminar given August 17th, 2023 at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado, uh, hosted by Kirsten Alberi, Director of its Material Science Center. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Kirsten. As Kirsten mentioned, and as some of you know, I've been a researcher in physical sciences and engineering for most of my career, uh, working on semiconductor, ma semiconductor materials and devices. For the past 10 years, though, since 2013, I've been increasingly engaged in meta-research, research into how human intelligences advance technoscience so that we might improve the design of the policies and institutions that underlie that, that advance. This book on the left, The Genesis of Technoscientific Revolutions, published in 2021 with my co-author Venki Nariyadaburdi, uh, is one of the results. On a separate front, there has also been, as we all know, amazing progress this past decade in artificial intelligence, with new applications emerging daily. One of those applications is AI for science and engineering. So a natural question to ask is, can we build on what we have learned about how human intelligences advance technoscience to enable artificial intelligences to do the equivalent? I think so, and am very excited about the synergy between these two efforts. Now, it could very well be that artificial intelligences will be able to advance technoscience differently than human intelligences do. But human intelligences have done pretty well over the centuries and are a natural starting point. Plus, instantiating technoscience advances, advance in artificial intelligences might then circle back to helping us improve how human intelligence, human intelligences advance technoscience. So what I'd like to do today is talk about both efforts, the human and the artificial. On the human side, I'll start with what, what, with what Venki and I call the nouns of technoscience. What is technoscience and how is it nurtured? How is it structured? Then I'll turn to what Venki and I call the verbs of technoscience. How technoscience advances via what we call the technoscientific method, an extension of the scientific method that includes for the first time the crucial role of technology. Then I'll turn to what Venki and I call the adverbs of technoscience, whether the advances are of an exploratory or an exploitative nature, which will map to what we would in common use call research and development. Then I'll turn to some of the implications of this way of viewing how technoscience advances on the design of the policies and institutions that enable those advances, particularly with a focus on the exploratory research end of the spectrum. Then on the artificial side, I'll outline an early take on mapping how human intelligences advance technoscience to how artificial intelligences might advance technoscience. This will mean becoming more quantitative about things that as human intelligences we take for granted. First, I'll talk about the reward function, what I like to call useful learning for advancing technoscience. Second, I'll talk about the game that is being played to get those rewards, a multi-agent co-opetition in which individual agents compete to surprise the common wisdom of the society of agents to which they belong. And third, I'll talk about the different kinds of knowledge representations, symbolic and connectionist, necessary to facilitate that co-opetition. And before we dive in, a quick heads up, I do like to spend quite a bit of time on my slides, so it may seem like I'm going pretty slowly, but I only have these seven uh, content slides. OK, let's start on the human side and with the nouns uh, of technoscience. As you see here, we posit two repositories of technoscientific knowledge, science denoted by the symbol S on the left, and technology denoted by the symbol T on the right. Importantly, these two repositories are independent with neither deriv derivative of, of the other. Technology is not what some would call the application of science. It's its own kind of knowledge separate from science. 
these two repositories of techno-scientific knowledge, we break apart in turn into two bins each. The science repository's two bins are facts and explanations of those facts. The technology repository's two bins are human desired functions and forms that fulfill those functions. Note that this binning is not universally accepted. Sometimes science is viewed to be just the explanations with facts coming from outside of science. And sometimes technology is viewed to be just the forms with human desired functions coming from outside of technology. In our framework, scientific explanations and facts are on equal footing and technological forms and the functions they fulfill are also on equal footing. In this way, it becomes natural to borrow the familiar nomenclature from science and technology of questions, Q, and answers, A. If we think of facts as questions and of explanations as the answers to those questions, and if we think of functions as questions and of forms as answers to those questions, then we can think of scientific and technological knowledge as both organized into question and answer pairs. These question and answer pairs in turn can be thought of as recursively nested the way complex adaptive systems typically are. On the science side, scientific facts can be thought of as questions looking for answers for explanations of those facts. Those answers, those explanations can themselves be thought of as facts at a deeper level of the hierarchy as questions looking for deeper answers deeper explanations for shallow, shallower explanations. The refraction of light is an observed fact at one level, explained by Snell's law, one level below, in turn explained at a deeper level by the wave theories of Huygens and Fresnel, and then at an even deeper level by Maxwell's equations. On the technology side, technological functions can also be thought of as questions looking for answers for forms that fulfill those functions. With, uh, with those with those answers, those forms themselves questions or subfunctions looking for deeper answers, deeper forms to fulfill them. An iPhone is a form that fulfills the human desired function of portable computing and communications, but it also represents represents an integrated collection of subfunctions, all of which require subforms like Gorilla Glass or integrated circuits to fulfill. And these subforms represent sub sub functions that in turn require sub sub forms to fulfill. Of course, that's too neat and tidy. Questions are normally answered by compound answers, answers composed of multiple subunits. So so there's a there is a fan out of questions into the space of answers. Likewise, answers normally help answer multiple questions. So there is also a fan out of answers into the space of questions. The result is that science and technology are both organized into seamless and highly interconnected webs of questions and answers. Okay, we've talked about the nouns, the nouns of technoscience, the repositories of technoscientific knowledge. Now, how do those repositories advance? They advance via the technoscientific method. A new phrase that Fenke and I coined to represent the interacting combination of the scientific method, what we call what we call S dot, and, and the engineering method, what we call T dot. The scientific method on the left will be more familiar to you, so let's start with that. That method starts with S1 dot, the finding of facts, both new facts that go beyond existing theory as well as new facts intended, intended to test emerging theory. This last piece being, of course, classic hypothesis testing. With facts in hand, the, the method proceeds to S2 dot, the finding of explanations for those facts. This is classic theorizing. And then with emerging explanations in hand, the method proceeds to S3 dot, the generalizing of those explanations to predict possible new facts triggering a hunt for those new facts, coming full circle back to the, to the half of S1 dot that is hypothesis testing. The engineering method on the right will be less familiar to you, but it's exactly and beautifully analogous to the scientific method. The method starts with T1 dot, the finding of human desired functions. Practical utility may be behind some of the functions, 
but curiosity and learning may also be behind some of the functions. Then with functions in hand, the method proceeds to T2 dot, the finding of forms that fulfill those functions. This brings us to the third leg, T3 dot, the co-opting of existing forms to fulfill functions they were not originally intended to fulfill. This we call exapting, a word borrowed from evolutionary biology in which biological forms like dinosaur feathers for thermo thermoregulation are co-opted for other functions like flight. The reason we coined the technoscientific method as a new phrase is because as we all know, but here we've made explicit, the scientific en and engineering methods are not independent of each other. Science can proceed without engineering and much science does proceed without engineering. Engineering can proceed without science and much engineering does proceed without science. But science advances much faster when it makes use of engineering, especially when facts are found using technology. And engineering advances much faster when it makes use of science, especially when forms can be ruled out and ruled in by science. Importantly, we view this technoscientific method, and here I will make a very strong statement as being complete. Each of the six mechanisms is essential and there are no additional mechanisms. If you wanted to create an artificial intelligence to advance technoscientific knowledge, it would need to execute all of these mechanisms, and it would also only need to execute these mechanisms. Okay, we've talked about the nouns of technoscience, the facts and explanation of, of technoscience, the facts and explanations of science, and the forms and functions of technology. And we've talked about the verbs of technoscience, the six mechanisms of the technoscientific method via which technoscience advances. The third and final piece of the puzzle we call the adverbs, the two very different ways in which the mechanisms of the technoscientific method can be executed in a manner that explores what we don't know versus in a manner that exploits, exploits what we do know. At a high level, we compare as illustrated at the left, the evolution of technoscientific knowledge to the evolution of biological life. The evolution of biological life is described by punctuated equilibria in which species for the most part adapt to their environment as time goes on. That's meant to be conveyed by the thickening of these lines as time advances upwards. Every once in a while though, there are sideways breaks where completely new species are created. In the case of knowledge evolution, there is the extension and consolidation of existing knowledge, again conveyed by the thickening of the lines as time advances upwards. And there is also the punctuation by sideways breaks as existing knowledge is surprised and overturned. The first kind of knowledge evolution we associate with development. It exploits what we already know, it seeks to extend and consolidate common wisdom. It can be strategic and planable. The second kind of knowledge evolution we associate with research. It explores what we don't know. It seeks to surprise common wisdom, and because it seeks surprise, it is inherently opportunistic and unplanable. Importantly, research and development, exploration and consolidation are adverbs that modify both the scientific and engineering methods. All four of the resulting permutations in this quad chart are possible. In scientific research, what we might call revolutionary science, common wisdom was surprised by Galileo's new fact of the moons of Jupiter. In engineering research, what we might call disruptive engineering, common wisdom was surprised by the Wright brothers' heavier than air flight. In scientific development, what we might call normal science, common wisdom has been extended by the observations and explanations of the properties of silicon, by some accounts the most studied of all materials. In engineering development, what we might call standard engineering, Moore's law has inspired decades of extensions in integrated circuit forms in their functions. In other words, research is not confined to scientific advance, at scientific advance, and R is not equal to S dot. Likewise, development is not confined 
to technological advance and D is not equal to T dot. And I want to emphasize this idea almost universally. It is instead thought that research as scientific advance is what feeds development as engineering advance. Here we are saying the op opposite. And research can be either scientific or engineering advance, and it can feed development also as either scientific or engineering advance. In fact, if one were to choose which direction is most important for major advances in techno-scientific knowledge, it might be the backward direction from engineering to science. It is engineering that is our direct interface to the real world, real world, and it is the real world that is what techno-scientific knowledge is about. Let me now let me now say a few words about implications on policy and institutional design uh, for research. Uh, and by focusing on research, I don't mean to suggest that development is less important. It's just as important. But research is more fragile, I believe, and more challenging to nurture. Here I illustrate one such design, a design that draws inspiration from, from the iconic Bell Labs 1.0 of the 20th century, a lab th that there is widespread admiration of, but whose magic it has been unclear how to resurrect in a 21st century form. This design is intended to represent the minimum preconditions necessary to resurrect a 21st century Bell Labs 2.0. It's only a first step, and one of Venki and my hopes is to inspire deeper thinking and experimentation with various organizational forms to understand how to better nurture research through policy and institutional design. The first precondition is at the bottom right, a home base provided by a mission organization. The mission organization could be a private corporation like AT&T was, or it could be a government organization like Enron. What's important is that the organization have a mission that brings it into contact with the real world and with a broad problem-rich environment. For AT&T, this mission was telecommunications for the mass public. For NREL, this mission is renewable energy. Now, it's easy to think the opposite that a mission organization is too practical and would not be able to nurture research in surprise. Definitely that can happen, and which is why the second precondition that we'll talk about in a second is also critical. But you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The real world is where is what techno scientific knowledge is about. So close integration with the real world's problem rich environment is critical. That brings us to the second precondition, a research funder separate from the, from the mission organization. The research funder could be a government agency like NSF, or it could be a philanthropy like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. What's important is that the research funder reward broader, long-term, longer-term impact. In other words, it is one thing to be inspired by the mission organization's problem-rich environment. But as a researcher is attacking those problems and finds something surprising, the researcher must opportunist, opportunistically shift to that something that is surprising. Since by definition, no one can know the ultimate impact of surprise, it is not unlikely that the major impact will lie outside the narrow, the narrow and shorter term focus of the mission organization. It is for this reason that mission organizations have difficulty supporting research. Many attribute the decline in the US of uh, the decline of research in the US to short-sighted institutional leadership in the extreme shareholder capitalism that keeps that leadership on a short leash. I don't agree with that. The mission organization's leadership is simply doing its job of mission and development and doing it very well. Research requires its own external source of funds. So the first and second preconditions represent two ideas that are in a necessary tension with each other. First, you need a host mission organization for the inspiration that comes from narrower, immediate, real world, real world problems. But second, you need an external research funder to liberate broader long-term impact. I like, I like to call this tension 
broad impact, narrowly inspired. And it is a tension that requires both a narrower minded mission organization and a broader minded research funder. This brings us to the third precondition, an organization that is separate from both the mission organization and the research funder. What's important is that this, this organization has autonomy, that its leadership is empowered to nurture its people and to experiment with how best to nurture its people. On the one hand, if the research organization were instead subsumed into the mission organization with research funding matrixed in, as it often currently is, its research culture would be driven out by missions development culture. As Venki and I like to say, we are humans first, intellect second. As humans, we respond first and foremost to our local culture. So research must be organizationally separated from mission. On the other hand, if the research organiza organization were subsumed into the research funder, there would be no accountability. The research funder must be external to the research organization so that it can hold the research organization accountable to research excellence. There's a lot more that I could say about this slide, but let's move on now to the artificial intelligence part of the talk. To do that, we have to make things more quantitative. Let's start here with rewards. What is it that an agent should be rewarded for as it advances technoscience? Here we make use of two ansatzes, two basic assumptions. The first ansatz is what I call the evolutionary ansatz, that technoscientific advance serves an evolutionary purpose. In the exploration and exploitation processes that evolutionary adaptive systems use to produce and employ useful knowledge about their environments, success means advance in that useful knowledge. Technoscientific advance is useful learning. The second ansatz I call the Simonton ansatz after Dean Simonton, that we might express useful learning as the product of utility and learning, U.L. Knowledge advance can only be high if both utility and learning are high. If either is low, then knowledge advance is low. Now let's make this more concrete using the diagram at the bottom left. Suppose we have a potential nugget of knowledge and we make guesses as to its utility. Along the left axis of this graphic in red, I plot our best guess, our best guess before the potential nugget of knowledge has been tested. Along the right axis in blue, I plot our best guess after the potential nugget of knowledge has been tested. In this particular scenario, I've drawn a prior pop probability probability distribution that is broad and at the lower end of the utility scale and a posterior probability distribution that is narrower and at the higher end of the utility scale. This means that after testing, we've learned. We've learned that the potential new nugget of knowledge is more useful than we originally thought, and we are less uncertain about that usefulness. To measure how much we've learned, we use the so-called so Kohlbeck-Liebler KL, KL divergence, a standard measure of the information gained when a prior is updated to a posterior probability distribution. I won't go through the math, but we'll just say that how much one has learned ends up depending on two key characteristics of the distributions, of the two distributions. S is what we call surprise. It's basically the change in the mean values of the two distributions. Delta B is what we call blindness reduction. It's basically the change in the widths of the distributions. It's not exact, but if one follows through the math, one gets approximately the following. Learning is the sum of a term that goes as the square of surprise and a term that goes as the log of blindness reduction, with the first mapping to the desired outcome of research and the second mapping to the desired outcome of development. And because surprise is what we might also call implausibility, we can think of the first term, first term as being implausible utility and the second term as being plausible utility. Both are important, but I want to call special attention to the first, to 
implausible utility, which can also be mapped to creative outcome. Creative outcome is an outcome that is both useful, useful and surprising. It isn't an outcome that is useful and unsurprising. That's not to say that useful and unsurprising isn't important. It is. It just isn't creative outcome. It also is an outcome that is useful and novel. Novelty is often thought to be one of the criteria of creative outcome. In this formulation, novelty is not necessary for creative outcome. It's surprise that is necessary. Novelty might be a good leading indicator of surprise, but that's all it is. You can have novelty that isn't surprising, like a never before seen license plate number that doesn't overturn any previous knowledge. You can also have surprise that isn't novel, like the observations of Neptune that had been under that had been under astronomers' noses for centuries before they were suddenly taken seriously as a possible new planet. OK, let's continue to focus on the surprise on the surprise piece, which is what what one is looking for in research outcome. But what do we mean when we say surprise? Surprise to whom? Is it surprise to the individual doing the research? Or is it surprise to common wisdom, to expert peers in the knowledge domain the individual is working in? In scientific and engineering research, of course, it's the latter. Common expert wisdom is ultimately what is cumulative, what society passes on from one generation to the next. So we're talking about what the creativity community calls big C creativity, surprise to society, not little c creativity, surprise to the individual researcher. But what about the latter? Does surprise to common wisdom imply surprise to the individual? No, it doesn't. To see why not, I've drawn this diagram with two axes. The bottom axis is what common wisdom thinks the utility of the potential new nugget of knowledge might be. The left axis is what the individual researcher thinks the utility of the potential new nugget of knowledge might be. On the, di on the diagram is depicted two possibilities. At one extreme is possibility A, in which common wisdom thinks the utility will be high, as does the researcher. In this possibility, there is not much opportunity for surprise. Even if the researcher is right that this potential new nugget of knowledge will be useful, it won't be surprising to common wisdom because common wisdom already thinks it will be useful. At the other extreme is possibility B, in which common wisdom thinks the utility will be low, but the researcher disagrees and thinks it will be high. This is where there is opportunity for surprise. It is precisely when the researcher disagrees with common wisdom that there is opportunity for surprise to common wisdom. Why might the researcher disagree? It might be because the researcher has some inside knowledge that gives him or her an unfair advantage over common wisdom. Maybe the researcher has a new tool like Galileo's telescope that enabled him to see the moons of Jupiter and thereby overturn Earth exceptionalism. Or maybe the researcher has thought through the problem more deeply, down to first principles, like Einstein's deep thinking leading to the theory of special relativity, and thereby overturning the belief in the independence of time and space. Maybe the researcher has insight into human nature that, like Steve Jobs, enabled him to see the human desired functionality of iPhones, even at $500 per phone, that few others could. Or maybe the researcher has insight into related knowledge domains, like bicycles enabling the Wright brothers to disprove the impossibility of heavier than air flight. In other words, it is when the researcher is not just a contrarian, but an informed contrarian, that there is the most opportunity for surprise. Any researcher can be a contrarian just to be a contrarian, but not just any researcher can be an informed contrarian, so deeply informed that there is a decent chance the researcher is right and common wisdom is wrong. The bottom line is opportunity for surprise is maximized when there is the greatest discrepancy 
between the researchers and common wisdom's guesses about utility. It's a bit like what Peter Thiel, the high-tech venture capitalist, says, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with. Let me make one last point about Big C creativity before we move on, that it depends on multi-agent co-opetition. Cooperation is required because common wisdom must be rolled up from the knowledge of individual agents. But competition is also required as individual agents compete with each other to surprise that common wisdom. So a key question, one that we'll speculate on the next slide, is how do human, much less artificial intelligences, do that? One possibility for how human intelligences do that and for how artificial intelligences might do that is that we make use of two very different knowledge representations. One knowledge representation illustrated in green on the left is symbolic. It is what Michael Polanyi would call formal and logical. It is reductionist and explanatory. Most importantly, it is teachable from one agent to another, so is cumulative even as individual agents are born and die. The other knowledge representation illustrated in red on the right is connectionist. This is what Michael Polanyi would call tacit knowledge. It's the recognitional knowledge that enables us to holistically see either the young or old woman in this gestalt sketch, but not both at the same time. It isn't teachable and it isn't cumulative. However, because it is holistic, it allows us, us to see patterns and analogies across knowledge domains that we wouldn't see if we were limited to reductions thinking within one knowledge domain. The analogies could be just hallucinations, of course, but they could also be breakthrough insights that lead to surprise. Switching from seeing the old woman, uh, switching from seeing the young woman to seeing the old woman could be just, just the aha that solves some puzzle at hand. For human intelligences, we could liken the connectionist and symbolic knowledge representations to Daniel Kahneman's System 1 and System 2, think fast, think slow modes of thinking. Think slow is symbolic thinking. It's accurate, rational, but slow. Oftentimes, it is so slow that you have to use computers to do it. Even with computers, it can be too slow and hence drives the Department of Energy, for example, to build its supercomputers for scientific computing. Think fast is instinctive thinking. It's inaccurate, irrational, but fast. It's why ChatGPT and other machine learning models can be so fast. Even if the neural network they are based on has hundreds of billions of parameters, once the parameters are frozen, once the model has been trained, inference using the model is holistic and instant. No symbolic manipulation is required. If this is right, then we need both knowledge representations. Symbolic representations to enable us to accumulate knowledge and turn it into common wisdom. And connection, connectionist representations to enable us to surprise common wisdom. This also means we need to be able to translate back and forth between representations. On the one hand, we need to translate from the connectionist to the symbolic. For artificial intelligences, this is known as explainable AI, where one tries to explain how it is that a machine learning model can distinguish cats from dogs. For human intelligences, we might call this explain the aha. It's not enough to have a sudden new insight. You have to represent the insight symbolically so that you can explain it to yourself and others. On the other hand, we need to translate from the symbolic to the connectionist. We might call this instinctivize the symbolic. I liken this to the following classroom experience that many of us have many of us have had. You're taking a STEM class and you learn the symbols and equations and how to manip manipulate them so that you can do problem sets. But you're still pretty mystified, so you keep thinking and thinking about it. Then just when you've almost given up, you have an aha moment in which suddenly you understand what the symbol, symbols and equations are about. Finally, let me come full circle and connect back to the techno-scientific method. Uh, in that language, cumulative science and technology, s and 
is symbolic and rational. It's basically Isaac Newton's, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. In contrast, advances in science and technology, S dot and T dot, are connectionist and intuitive. It's basically Albert Einstein's imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Let me close now with a few takeaways. Takeaway one is that the techno-scientific method isn't mysterious. It's just a series of steps that human agents do. There's no reason to believe that we couldn't improve how human agents execute it. And there's no reason to believe we couldn't map it to how artificial agents might execute it. Takeaway two is that research success in science and engineering also isn't mysterious. Its essence, its, its essence is surprise and implausible utility. Takeaway three is that implausible utility also isn't mysterious. It's basically a multi-agent co-opetition game. Agents cooperate to create common wisdom while competing to surprise that common wisdom. Takeaway four is that one key to implementing that co-opetition might be two different knowledge representations. The symbolic to represent and to represent and accumulate common wisdom, and the connectionist for the imaginative analogical reasoning that surprises common wisdom. With that, thank you for your attention.